curly brace, key colon value, con comma, key colon value, comma, key colon value, end curly brace. Okay, so this is kind of like the at sign square brackets for arrays or the at sign parentheses for NS numbers. This is NS dictionary's version of that. Um, you look up things inside a dictionary. You can obviously do object for key. That's a nice method for looking a value up by key. But you can also use square brackets that looks kind of like looking up in an array. So if I had that colors dictionary that's showing right there, and I had a string like that was either green or blue or red, uh, and I wanted to look it up, I can just say colors, open square bracket, the color string. And it'll look up that string. We would return nil if there's no, no such key in there. And uh, it will return the value, the actual UI color. We're going to talk about UI colors in a couple of slides. OK? So this is also really cool um, UI, or syntax, rather, for, uh, for accessing stuff. These, these at sign square brackets, at sign curly brace, at sign parentheses, big improvement to Objective-C. Um, of course, you can say how, see how many objects in there. You can do object for key to get it. Key has to implement hash and is equal. Right? It's a hash table. You have to be able to hash the key so you can have an efficient lookup. But then two things might hash to the same thing. So you have to have is equal, determine whether two objects that hash to the same thing are actually equal. Um, obje NS object implements this very poorly. <laughs> okay? So you would never use a generic object or some subclass of object that you've created. Uh, you would never use it as a key. Um, it's probably going to do pointer hashing, so it would only do it if your objects are always unique in the heap. There's never two objects that are the same, that have different pointers. Um, strings are excellent keys in NS dictionaries, and so I would say strings are the key in a dictionary 90% of the time. Okay? They're very good, they hash really well, they're very fast to do is equal, etc. Okay? Of course, Immutable, again, we'd like to sometimes add things to our dictionaries. So we have a mutable version, NS mutable dictionary, usually created with alloc init. Um, it has all the things of a dictionary, plus it has set objects for key that adds a key value pair. And you can remove objects, add entries from another dictionary, et cetera, et cetera. Looping through a dictionary looks like this. You do for id key in the dictionary. So basically, when you do for in on a dictionary, you're looping through the keys. Okay. Now, of course, inside, it's really easy to just say value equals object for key, and say, or even use the square brackets notation uh, to get the value. So you, you're kind of looping through the values, too. Um, as long as your hashing is efficient, which it is if they're strings, this is things. It is possible to, get, uh, to ask a dictionary, give me all your values as an array. And then you could for in through that array. And whether that's more efficient than doing this probably depends on the size of your dictionary, et cetera, et cetera. Don't worry about it. It's never going to be an issue in this class. We're not going to have dictionaries of thousands of objects. OK? All right. Next thing I'm going to talk about is not a class or syntax or whatever. It's a word, a phrase, property list. OK? And I'm just going to define this term. You need to know what this term means, property list. A property list means a collection of collections. Okay, what's a collection? NS array, dictionary, even string, NS data, NS number, those are all simple collections if you want to think of them that way, or they're the leaf nodes of collections. Um, so if you have any object graph that just has arrays and dictionaries, numbers, strings, dates, and datas, then it's called a property list. So just for example, if you had an array of strings, that's a property list. An array of arrays, and those arrays contain property list, it's the property list. Okay, so any arbitrary graph, but as soon as you have any object in there that's not one of these things, or they're mutable versions, that's allowed too, so you can have NS mutable strings or NS mutable arrays in there, um, then it's a property list, okay? Uh, a dictionary is only a property list if all of its keys and all of its values are property lists, okay? So a dictionary that keys are strings and values are arrays or other dictionaries of property lists, that would be a property list. Uh, why do we define this term? Because there's a bunch of API throughout iOS that you're going to see that takes a property list as the argument. But property list is only a phrase we define, so it's probably going to take an ID. Okay? It's going to take an ID. It might take an NS array or an NS dictionary, depending on the API. Um, but it's basically saying in its, in its documentation, the argument to this is a property list. So even if it's an array, it's got to be an array of property lists. If it's a dictionary, it's got to be a dictionary that has only property lists as keys and values. If it's an ID, it's got to be an array or a dictionary or a string or a number or what, you know what I mean? It's got to be a property list, okay? Make sense? 
And in fact, I'm going to show you one class that only operates on property list, which is NS user defaults. So NS user defaults is this one shared dictionary, essentially, that persists even across application launching, okay, exiting and launching. So it's like a permanent NS dictionary, kind of. Um, everything that's stored in an NS user default database has to be a property list, okay? So it's not a full-on database, though, all right? It's pretty small. It's not really high performance. So you only want to store small things in there. Okay, you don't want to be storing huge images or anything like that, you know, turning them into NS datas or something and storing them. You really don't want to do that. Small strings and arrays of strings and NS numbers, the dates maybe, those kind of things. It's good to is okay. Um, it's API. Uh, to access it, you call this class method on NS user defaults called standard user defaults. And that will give you an instance that is shared across your entire application. It's like a global. Okay, there's only one of these things, and uh, you send messages to it like this set array for key. Um, there's also set double for key, set object for key. That object would have to be a property list. Uh, so it's kind of like a dictionary, but it has these extra methods like set double for key so that you can pass, prim you know, store primitive types in there without having to turn them into NS numbers first. It type check, you know, it's kind of you get the type checking of it versus just set object for key where it can't, doesn't know whether that's a double or not, um, et cetera. So and some of this, because now we have the auto box, you know, the at sign, parentheses, business, some of this API, we don't really need that much anymore, but it's all still in there, yeah. So is, is this property list idea, does that have to cascade down through all of its sub? Yeah, so the question is, does the property list idea have to cascade down through all of the sub things? And the answer is yes. A property list, for it to be a property list, everything in the entire object graph has to be a property list, all the way down, okay? No exceptions. And if you were to, for example, call set object for key, uh, and you passed it something that somewhere down a leaf node was a card, right, or some non-property list thing, this method would raise an exception and say, that's not a property list, okay, at runtime. So crash your program at runtime. Um, the other thing to remember, though, is once you've gotten this standard user default instance and you've stored what you want, you have to call this method synchronize on the instance, okay? So NS user default, standard user default, synchronize. That's what makes it permanent. So you write a few things, a little batch, and then synchronize, okay? Don't forget to synchronize. If you were to set some things in there and your app crashed before you did the synchronize, it would not get saved, okay? When your app launched again, It'll be gone, the stuff you put in there, okay? Um, the last thing really I'm gonna talk about that's kind of in the core part of uh, foundation is NS range, which is just a C struct. It's exactly what you think. It describes a range. This might be a range in a string, or it could be a range in an array. It's basically a starting location, that's the NSU integer location, and a length, how many characters or how many items in the array. There's an important, uh, constant called ns not found all right ns not found is the value of location in a range that was not found or that is otherwise invalid okay so it's you'd like search for a substring in a string and it couldn't find it you're going to get a range back that the location is going to be ns not found everyone understand that um, there's also this thing ns range pointer that's basically just an ns range star Okay, now I told you in iOS we don't really put um, structs in the heap, and we don't. This NS range pointer is for call by reference ranges. Okay, so some methods will take an NS range pointer as an argument, one of its arguments, and what it's saying there is if you pass me a pointer to a range, I'll fill it in with some information. Almost always you can pass null there and it won't fill the information in because you won't be pointing to a range, but it's for that, it's for reference. Everyone know what it means to call by reference? Question? Yeah. The reason that, I just out of curiosity, why, why are you using unsigned, or why did Apple choose to use unsigned numbers for range, to the ranges? Because that seems like you can't represent uh, range over negative numbers. Yeah, so the question is, why did Apple choose to make location be an unsigned integer? In other words, why can the range only be a positive range? 
And I think the main reason they did that is, uh, you know, they designed Dennis Range for their own purposes, like ranges in arrays, ranges in strings. They never want to represent that. And I will bet you dollars to donuts, and it's not found, is either the maximum integer or it's minus, or it's, you know, whatever, negative, which sometimes are the same thing, right? If you know how computer science works, a lot of times it's all the bits inverted, that's minus one, that also would be at the end of the range. So um, I think it's just because they didn't need it for anything else and they wanted to make their API clearer, possibly. I don't, know. I don't work at Apple, never did, so I don't really know what, why they did that. Um, okay, so that's really kind of it for the foundational stuff. Uh, I am going to talk about some more classes in foundation, but first we're going to take a little detour and talk about a couple classes in UIKit, okay? And those are colors and fonts. All right, so UI color, super simple class, represents a color. Um, the color can be represented in so many different ways. RGB, red, green, blue, right? HSB, that's hue, saturation, and brightness. Uh, it can even be a pattern. <laughs> okay, so you, you can have a color that is a UI image pattern in there, and when you draw with that color, it'll draw with the pattern. Um, so color, super powerful, but nice and simple API. Um, colors can also have alpha. Okay, how many people in here do not know what alpha is? Never heard the phrase alpha. So everybody knows what alpha is. Okay, so that's a first. Um, so alpha, which in computer graphics is how transparent it is, one being fully opaque and zero being fully transparent, uh, you can create colors that are, not, that are partially transparent. And then if you draw with them, you'll be able to see behind where you filled in. So it's really, colors are really cool. Um, there's a handful of kind of standard colors, the green color, red color, purple color, whatever. Uh, you can look in its documentation to find those. They're just class methods. There's also a few methods in there like the light text color, which is the shade of gray for light text, disabled text, or whatever. So you can look at all that. Okay, so colors are simple. Fonts, not so simple. <laughs> okay, now fonts in iOS 7 are incredibly important to get right. Okay, a huge percentage of good iOS 7 UI design is picking the right fonts and using fonts in the right way arranging fonts on screen in a nice way, super important. So there's a lot of support in iOS 7 that's new that is basically about making it easy to do the right thing with fonts. So I put up some examples of some iOS 7 apps here, and you can see how front and center fonts are on all these things, okay? If you had ugly fonts here or the raw, raw, you didn't have bold or you had you know, fonts that were too smashed together or hard to read, uh, or the wrong color, these UIs would be, you know, impossible to decipher or very difficult to decipher here. So color and uh, background colors and, you know, the size of fonts and all these things are all critically important in all of these applications, okay? So we're going to talk a little bit about how to deal with this and what's in there for iOS 7. Uh, to make this happen. I can't really, unfortunately I don't have enough time in lecture in general to go through all of this. Uh, you will, I'll kind of distribute little bits of wisdom about it as we go through uh, various UIs uh, in lecture and demos and things like that. Uh, but I'm going to try and give you today is just the basis for how we present text on screen, okay? Uh, what the primitives are for that and how we do it in the right way so that we get consistency. You see, one thing about all these apps